Hello and welcome to Disc Review, the podcast that goes track by track through a different album each week. And we're your hosts, Max and Matt. Join us as we explore some of our favorite records. No, I'm a fan, I swear, I swear. I, I feel like I've become a music normie. I'm tired of being Mr. Positive Guy. Dude, it's, that's not human. This is certifiably the most boring album I've ever heard. Uh, and there's a reason they don't do it, because it's terrible. We hope you enjoy the show. Let's get into it. All right, hello, welcome to another episode of Disc Review. So happy to be back, and you know what? Today we're reviewing something that's uh, sort of near and dear to my heart, and definitely ha- I've had a long history with it. Um, Isles and Glaciers, The Hearts of Lonely People. So, Matt, what do, we, what do you think about this album? Well, I learned about this from you. I think you sent me Empty Size and Wine, and I was kind of hyped. I mean, for people who don't know, this is a super group which kind of means taking some big stars from uh, several bands in the same genre, putting them all together and seeing what happens. Kind of a fun idea, and I'm shocked it isn't more common. But yeah, this is, I mean, good time for people who are fans of these artists. We've got Craig Owens from Chiodos, Johnny Craig from, at the time, Emerosa, Vic Frentes from Pierce the Veil, and do you know the rest of the names of all the people? There's a Sleeping um, with Sirens guitarist. Yeah, the drummer is from Pierce the Veil as well. Well, a bunch of dudes, if you're a big fan of this genre, I think you probably know this this group, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm actually surprised that this hasn't been done more often because it's a really good idea. And while Isles and Glaciers didn't go on to, you know, do much, this uh, little EP, I think I called it an album before. It's just an EP. Um, this EP, you know, is is loved by a lot of people i wouldn't say that it you know it it doesn't have a ton of streams but it it did decent and people like it and i like it so um i think it's a really good idea i think logistically it's probably pretty hard to set up which is maybe why it's not done very often but yeah um it's a super group uh i don't know who coined that term but it's it's pretty genius just to put yourselves in a room with a bunch of other dudes and call yourself a super group yeah Um, but before we start, what do you think about this album art here? Let me take a look. I mean, it's just a drawing of an iceberg, which, you know, obviously very apt for the t- for the name. And I don't know, it's pretty uh, edgy and of the era. This is from 2010. What do you think? Yeah, I wrote this album art is very much of the time. It's yeah. vibrant, has a lot going on with the imagery. Um, I kind of like that the glacier, you know, like below the water, kind of has some anatomical features. Um, that fits the theme of the record, and I think is pretty cool looking. They don't they don't make album art this way anymore. I feel like uh, back in the early 2010s, every emo band was trying to make the craziest scene they could with the most color in, in almost the same art style. Yeah, it's a little more toned down nowadays, for sure. Well, let's just jump right into it. The first track is Kings and Chandeliers. This is just an intro song uh, to the second song, Hills Like White Elephants. I think it does a decent job at setting the atmosphere of the album, but I usually skip this and just go straight to Hills Like White Elephants. I feel like I'm kind of a fraud because I've claimed to love intros and interludes and stuff, but I also like almost always skip them. Uh, I do think they add a lot of depth to albums and especially for like the first time going through and anytime you're listening to it all the way through I think that it adds a lot but I don't know I I do skip stuff like this quite often well let's return to our talk about interludes we had some interesting findings on like water parks album where their interludes had 3,000 streams compared to millions on the other songs it's not the case here I mean we've got over a million streams there's two instrumentals and listen, I think this first is the better instrumental, but I'm just, it's got, you know, close to as many streams as the actual songs on here. I'm just, I don't know if it's just that things have changed or what, because that's kind of shocking to me looking at the numbers on other bands. I mean, obviously this is a lot older, so maybe it's just people used to listen to instrumentals, but yeah, I don't really listen to the instrumentals. I usually skip them. I... I like a good instrumental, but it definitely is just like an intro to uh, to building up the song. It's not doing anything different than what you'd probably hear in the real song. So for that, yeah, I don't I don't usually listen to these. 
it's because Vic is associated with this album and everyone goes crazy for Vic so they'll, they'll stream those <laughs> intros yeah. all day long bro um, but yeah let's move on to Hills Like White Elephants I am assuming this song gets its name from the short story of the same name by Ernest Hemingway um, I haven't read that so I don't uh, have much to say about that but this is the start of a string of really crazy really fast songs on this EP something I'll probably mention a few times during this review is that the lyrics are both great at sometimes and just downright confusing um, at others for all these songs the reason for that may be that there was three dudes who were usually in charge of all the lyrics trying to collab this song, of course, has the classic line that gives the EP its name. These are the hearts of lonely people ripped in front of us. But what does that mean? I, I don't even think the guys who wrote it really know. Um, I, I do also want to mention that the lyrics on Spotify have some errors. There's one part where Vic is singing and there's just nothing. It didn't even try to uh, guess at what he was trying to say there. Yeah, don't use the Spotify lyric. It's, not, it's usually incorrect, which is a bummer because it's a cool feature. About this song, yeah, it's... I like that you brought up the lyrics. That's something I'll talk about a lot on all these songs. You're right, most of the time, to me, it's just nonsense. I've tried to make sense of it, but it's just all over the place. It doesn't have a coherent message, and I don't, like, know, like, it's, like, almost like it's trying to say something, but it doesn't really come together. Like, I just, I'm just confused. But, I mean, yeah, this, this song has a lot of, you know, energy. It's really, it's kind of fast. I I think it's I think it's all right. I mean, it definitely is um, showing you the style of this EP for sure. I think all of their songs, like their upbeat songs, or like sound just like this. Not really upbeat, but yeah, like high energy. I think it's definitely probably because there are three singers, and I mean, Craig Owens and Vic both like really cryptic lyrics. Yeah, and that's definitely their style. So when you and if they are not on the same page, who knows? Maybe you do get something where there's just cryptic lines and they don't really point you in a direction. <laughs> yeah, and I th I think that continues with the next song, Clush. I think Clush is probably my favorite. It's really fun to sing and has a lot of great one-liners. I, I think that for all the criticisms that could be made about uh, any of these three singers here, one thing that cannot be said is that they don't know how to sing. I think that Vic and Craig and Johnny all have really great voices that shine well in this song and throughout the EP. Johnny's voice is probably the most polished and fancy, but Vic and Craig both have that really unique emo voices that sell records. Like I mentioned before, there are some great one-liners, but the lyrics as a whole are quite confusing. I mean, what are they talking about? <laughs> I don't know. Um, I, I mean, I know Vic and Craig, like you mentioned before, are really big on poetic and cryptic lyrics that need a certain level of decoding, but this just feels like that on crack. I I'm, don't think I'm saying it needs decoding. Sometimes I think it doesn't mean anything. It's just some edgy words they threw together. I don't think there's always meaning behind every uh, emo band's <laughs> lyrics when they're this cryptic. But I think there can be. I'm just saying that there's not always, and I'm not sure what's going on here for sure. But I I think this is the best of like the heavy guitar driven stuff on the CP. This is the one I would pick if I wanted to listen to, you know, something high energy from them. The chorus is really good. And I think that this is the best highlight of having three singers. The way they just bounce off each other. It just, it shows you why a super group can be fun. Like all their different styles coming together and kind of shifting a little bit but still with the same energy it works really well yeah that's the best part about this record for sure the next song is empty size and wine i used to really like this song but some of the lines uh kind of bug me uh, and they're just kind of weird and sometimes out of place I mean, I think the line, I think I've ruined your body is the obvious one that sticks out as just weird. Like, Yeah, that didn't this, hold um, up. I'm no, obviously, is I was... it like a purity line? Is he talking about how she's like ruined because of sex? Like, I don't quite... It, that's the energy it gives off. Whether or not that's what they meant, I can't say, but... 
Yeah, I mean, uh, when I listened to this when I was 14, I never, I don't, never thought about lyrics, really. I just listened to the music, but listening to this, reading the lyrics long, I was like, what's going on here? And this is what I meant. It's like, are they just saying these cryptic lines and then not thinking about how it would come off? Maybe that's what happened, and they just weren't thinking about. But when you just take it on a surface level, that's definitely what you get, and it just, it makes me not like the song. Even though it has a really unique feel and sound, I don't know, I just, I couldn't decipher it any other way. Yeah, I don't know how we're supposed to interpret it, but I don't really love that. Um, and then there's the bridge with the most out of place lines I've ever heard. I mean, like, they have no connection to the rest of the song at all. Why are we all of a sudden singing it's, about a it's, church? Well, it's Where Craig Owens, from? and it just that just sounds like Chiodos lyrics. I don't know, yeah. like, from, I don't know, other, was it Bone Palace something? Bone Palace Ballet, yeah. yeah that Those lyrics, that's what it reminds me of, like that album. So I, I wonder if he yeah. just wrote his, his style of cryptic. Uh, lyrics. I'll tell you what bugs me more than anything is uh, now let me tell you how these steps go. What do you think of that? They're not even, you can't even perform these steps. Step one, tell me what have I done. Okay, I can do that. Step two, you know you better believe. What? That's not a step. Step three, you'll never be like me. That's not a step. I can't do anything. It doesn't, I don't, it doesn't make any sense. Oh what do you think about man. That? It's funny because I actually like that part of the song, but you're right. It does no, it is because he's got a good sense. flow. He's got a really good flow in that part. So I'm like, yeah, some steps. Yeah, lay it out. And then you're like, that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> uh, I do like the line, I want to tell her that I love her, but I just don't know. I, yeah. I think that's really good. But it comes right after I ruined your Yeah, body. exactly. <laughs> it's like they got to pick a lane more because you knew all over the place. I'm going to latch on to whatever... If something's offensive or something, then I'm gonna latch onto that, and mm -hmm. it can drag down your song. I just feel like, yeah, when there's when there's this many directions they're going in, it's you kind of just get lost. Well, that brings us to oceans for backyards. This is the other intro track that leads into Viola Lion. This one is about as interesting as the first, and you know, definitely adds to fill the runtime of the EP and get a few more million royalties. But other than that, I just don't think it's necessary. I think this one, I don't know. I was really disappointed coming back to this because I don't think it does anything. It's just got some humming and then it's got the, what is it? Like a Celeste that's mm -hmm. part of the next song, but that's really it. You're not really getting anything out of this. So not, not one of my favorite instrumentals interludes. It just, I think this could have just been either shortened and part of the actual song or just taken out. Yeah, I totally agree. The next is Viola Lion. And this song might have the worst song name I've ever heard. <laughs> I, tr yeah. I truly think that Craig Owens is addicted to making the weirdest song names that make no sense. It, and all of these sound the like he named them. them. It really does. Mm -hmm. I used to think this style of song titling was cool um, and fun, but the more I experienced it, the more I realized that it makes it way harder to remember which song yeah. they're which. Um, I mean, it's 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 pretty easy for this EP because it's so short, but I, I used to listen to the first few Chiodos records a lot, and I couldn't really tell you which songs I liked off of it because uh, I can't I had the same problem the trying to get names. into that band. I, I kept forgetting which ones I liked because there's nothing to latch onto. They don't have hooks with, you know, a phrase that, you know, is the title. So I just kept forgetting, and I would stop listening. This was probably my least favorite um, actual song when I listened to it as a teenager. Coming back to it, this one grew on me more. I think it's really unique sounding. I don't think the chorus is like super strong, but I like the kind of melancholy feel. I don't know if you get that from this. Yeah, And then sure. I think it really picks up about halfway. I'm gonna find the line. When Vic takes over, he kind of just goes on this uh, just really good melody section and it just picks up so much energy i think that's when the song actually shines a lot then the last song is cemetery weather this song is the love ballad of the ep and also the closer it's uh it's really pretty and has a lot of great lyrics about wanting to uh, find someone that you can be with forever even after death and uh, this song 
kind of reminds me of like a selfish machine song like it definitely fits the yeah. early 2000s pierce the veil era yeah i i mean this is the highlight of the record for me this is the only reason i care about Oz and glaciers this was the song i really liked when i listened to it it's the perfect edgy love song for 14 year old and that's how it worked for me and i'm sure it's worked for tons of other 14 year olds just discovering owls and glaciers after listening to pierce the veil but i don't know it's just i think it's because of the like i was saying you can actually tell what they're talking about there's actually a direction they're going with the song the lyrics actually are coherent and they paint a picture and i just think it's way easier to latch onto the song and yeah i just think it works it's this really long big closer it's got like an extended outro and just a ton of really good melodies and sections with some perfect edgy lyrics for your emo music. Um, one thing I forgot to mention is that in 2014, they released a whole um, remix of this EP. Have you listened to that? No, is any of it any good? Um, yeah, it's, it's fine. I, I, I kind of like the original better, but if you're into remixes, I would definitely check it out. It's fun. Um, I'm not exactly sure where it came from or why they put it out, but yeah, it's kind of cool. As for this EP as a whole, I think that it's, it's, it stands on its own two legs. I mean, it, it gives the people what they want, and what they wanted was some powerhouses in the music scene to come together and, and sing about their woes. And uh, like we mentioned before, when they're when those singers are bouncing off each other and, and switching lines, it's really great. That's really cool. I think the the low moments of this record are um, some out of pocket lyrics and just some bizarre lyrics that don't make any sense. But other than that, it's pretty fun. Yeah, I agree. All right, now we're gonna move on to a little segment I like to call. I actually don't have a name for it. It's games. We're gonna play a game. Game. Um, a game that I made up and is totally unique to my brain. Um, it's called, uh, shoot, I didn't think of a name for this game either. But basically what's going to happen is I am going to tell Matt about two different songs and he has to guess which one has a higher stream count on Spotify. Now, Matt, you cannot look these up. All right. Not look at your Spotify. Let's see how high of a um, streak I can get. Yeah, I, I only um, I only have three uh, yeah. questions here. Uh, if this goes well, maybe we'll do more another time. But the first uh, matchup is Ed Sheeran's Perfect or The Weeknd's Starboy. Both very popular songs. Ed Sheeran, Perfect. Wow, that was pretty great. And it's a, clo- it's a close uh, running here too. So it is, yeah, it's Perfect is the, Give me is the, numbers. the higher one. Perfect has 2.2 billion, and The Weeknd's Starboy has 2 billion. Wow. So both huge, but yeah, Perfect takes the lead on that. That's one point for you, and it's, it's best two out of three. So the next one is Charlie Puth's Attention or Taylor Swift's Antihero off her new album. Hmm. That's tough. Uh, attention. And that is correct. Again, that's two for two. Um, yeah, I, I threw that in there to kind of trip you up because, uh, you know, Antihero is new. But Attention has 1.4 billion and Antihero only has 94 million. But it also okay. came out last week. So, all right. The final one. You've already won the game because you've got two out of three here. But let, let's see if you can go three for three. This is Pierce the Veil's Past the Nirvana, their new single. Or Chiodos is 3 a.m. Uh, Pass the Nirvana. And with that, you've locked in three for three. Maybe I didn't make this uh, hard enough for you. I got to make it harder next time. We'll see, yeah. Pass the Nirvana has 9 million. 3 a.m. only has 7 million. So I'm uh, surprised I had that much, to be honest. I know. (laughs) So Matt won. Um, maybe we'll do that game in the future if anyone likes it I thought it was uh, fun putting together at least Um, so yeah thank you guys for listening we're grateful to um, all of you who check out our stuff and um, the best way you can help us out is by word of mouth just showing our stuff to your friends and telling them that they should follow us and listen to us as well other than that though um, we'll see you next time thank you